So here we have uh, Caitlin Smallwood. Uh, she is leading data science at Netflix. And, and Netflix, of course, uses data science uh, a lot, you know, for all the beautiful recommendations or not so beautiful recommendations that they, <laughs> <laughs> that they give when you're watching. So uh, last year at WIT, uh, at the November of 15, you gave this fabulous talk about what's, uh, what's been happening, uh, what happened in data science and, and Netflix. So we're interested in hearing more about that today as well. And then there's Laurie Shearer, who is a uh, principal at Bain and & Company, and she's leading data analytics uh, there as well. So Lori, thank you. And, and for you, the interesting thing is that you're working with so many different companies uh, and, and of, in data science as well. So you can tell us uh, about how data science is penetrating you know, many, many aspects of our lives and, and, uh, and the industry uh, as, as, as well as academics, of course. That's so right. I was joking last night uh, yeah. that Caitlin represents the new and I represent the old. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. Which, uh, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, we work with major corporate corporations around the world and in every industry, there's not a CEO that isn't asking the question, you know, am I going to get Netflixed? Uh, it's actually become a verb. <laughs> uh, and that pertains to, you know, sort of the companies that are really innovating in the use of data and analytics to drive insights that the incumbents don't have. And so the incumbents around the world are all investing quite heavily in how do they assemble data, how do they build an analytic team, and how do they close the insights gap uh, with competitors like Netflix. So I think it's a super exciting time for both you know, traditional corporations as well as for uh, some of the upstarts in these industries. And in your work, you must also see that um, data scientists are often in these interdisciplinary teams, right? When you're applying data science to help a particular industry, I'm assuming that you're working with uh, uh, disciplinary experts as well as data scientists. As, yeah, and, and absolutely. So all the buzz is around agile development now, and companies are trying to move to agile. But I think it's just given a vocabulary to what analytic people have always done. Analytic people have to be combined with domain expertise and functional experts in the areas that they're trying to model or build analytics. And analytics has always been an iterative short bursts and sprints of put some stuff in the hopper, you know, see what sticks, you know, does it make sense, what about the outliers, etc. So analytic innovation has always been iterative uh, and cross-functional. So, Absolutely. I think this whole agile movement has just given a vocabulary to it. This is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about data science. You know, you learn about algorithms and then you can actually apply this to so many different fields. You know, Absolutely. when you're working with domain experts to help you out, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, every time you go through these learning curves and, and you get so much out of that. So, Caitlin, what's been happening at Netflix in the... Are you still working on the Netflix prize to try to improve your scores? Or? <laughs> the prize has, has been completed years ago, but we certainly still work quite a bit on the recommender system. Uh, but there are many, many other areas of application of data science at Netflix. We use it heavily in experimentation for optimizing the many aspects of the product. Um, very heavily in content these days to really understand what is an effective catalog. Um, even with specific titles, what can we do to really make sure we're designing titles for audiences that will really love those titles and finding those audiences um, both in marketing as well as in um, helping to drive awareness of those titles within the product. Um, and then on the streaming side, the kind of engineering aspects of delivering streaming uh, globally, there are tons of challenges that involve optimization around network traffic and how traffic gets delivered, as well as how we optimize uh, the compression of the files and things like that so that we can really um, handle low bandwidth situations and many types of devices. So it's a super exciting uh, space to be in, of course. And I will echo, you know, this thing about the functional expertise and domain knowledge is so important, as everyone in this room knows. Um, and whether your organization um, handles the structure of things in a centralized organization or decentralized, um, no matter what that domain knowledge is important. So, for example, we're a centralized team, but within our group, we're organized by functional areas so that people on the team can really have that deep knowledge about these different areas of the business, because each of them has a lot of complexity. Okay. So think, you both will see uh, you're at the forefront of this field. You see think, uh, new algorithms developed and applied. What are the most exciting trends 
uh, the, the most exciting new developments in the field that you've seen. And, and you could also talk about the biggest challenges you, that people are starting to address now. Laura, you want to chime in? Yeah. So again, back to this theme of old and new, um, I spent six years of my career at Fair Isaac or FICO. And FICO invented the credit score. And I always ask audiences like this, does anybody have any idea what year the FICO score was invented? Anybody want to take a guess? 1958. Good answer. Yeah, so <laughs> analytics is not new, right? And uh, the FICO score is used globally. It powers 70 billion consumer credit decisions a year. And it was groundbreaking, absolutely groundbreaking in its time because consumer lending had always been incredibly subjective. You know, the, the loan officer would look at how you were dressed and what kind of car you drove and decide whether or not to give you a loan. And the credit score actually objectified that decision. And so I think those innovations and many more like it. So the last time we had Diane Bryant here and she, from Intel, and she was talking about using wearable devices to try to solve Parkinson's disease. So I think some of these really big problems that have you know, societal implications and that can change the basis of competition in industries are the types of problems that I think are really, really exciting. And I'm so excited to see so many talented women here in this field because there's just incredible opportunity to, to work on those kinds of problems and have that kind of impact. So Caitlin, what's the, what's the best thing coming out of uh, Netflix this, right well, now? In broader trends, I would say similarly, these techniques like deep learning, the advancements there, and how effective it's really become are fascinating and uh, somewhat related natural language processing. And I kind of like to think of it as there's so much wonderful data that humans generate. And part of being a human are our five senses, right? And the more we can um, evolve these techniques that let us get at sight and sound and smell and, and perception and how the brain you know, processes all that, the more powerful the applications can really be. And it's incredibly exciting to see some of the progress in those areas. And so certainly within Netflix, you know, there are many applications where we're investigating applying quite a variety of techniques. So, but that space has really advanced so much. So what's the, the hardest, what's the hardest thing you're trying to do right now? with your group? Frankly, the hardest thing is, the hardest problems are really the things that are a little bit softer in nature. And so the things that are you know, NP hard, you can't really solve the problem perfectly, but you're trying to come up with a way to apply data science techniques to improve decision making beyond what it would have been without that technique. Um, and so in particular, in the content area, it's super hard. It's such a creative space. And you want to try to figure out, say, what's the optimal catalog um, there are obvious challenges like, uh, so you could think of it as a portfolio problem in some ways, but there are obvious challenges in terms of people's tastes and the sample of humanity that we have as Netflix members to understand that data, but then who are the Netflix non-members and, and what, is, what are those um, attributes of a piece of content that you might codify to try to best, best understand um, how it performs. So there are the unsupervised you know, things of understanding the viewing patterns, but then there's additional information that you could perhaps encode and encapsulate about a title. So it's just a super complicated space. And, and then you can think about problems like the size of the catalog um, and how does that, we call it compression internally, you know, how does this compression, you know, if you had 2,000 titles versus 1,000 titles in the catalog, how does your understanding about popular titles or titles, say, in the middle of the catalog, how does that change based on the size? Um, of the catalog. So they're just, it's an endlessly complicated, um, fun space. Yeah, and I would echo that too. A big part of our practice in working with companies is helping them with the adoption issues of these technologies. Mm -hmm. So the role of the knowledge worker is really changing. So in some of these decision processes, which involve left brain, right brain, creative, and the data and analytics insights, mm -hmm. and I think that's what you're alluding to, is mm -hmm. this, this combination of in your business, I can imagine the creatives like not really wanting to necessarily mm -hmm. always agree with what the data is telling them. Mm -hmm. And in insurance underwriting and in every decision process that involves a knowledge worker, those jobs are really changing. And those people are having to adapt mm -hmm. to this left brain, right brain paradigm. Absolutely. And, and just to speak to that, I agree that that's one of the bigger challenges these days is, you know, around the world, people are really understanding the power of data science. But then when they see a particular output, they may not want to believe that. 
And so this area of really being able to effectively communicate um, about data science is so vital, um, but incredibly difficult, particularly as the algorithms get better because they become a little more opaque, right? And so it's difficult to explain what's going on. And in an example from Netflix, um, on the content part of our organization, they'll often want to understand how is the recommender system treating a specific title? Because maybe we launched a new original title and it may be performing better than they expected or worse than they expected. And so they naturally say, well, what did the algorithms do with this title? Right. That is a very difficult question to answer well, and, the, and untangle, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and that brings up this question also is how can you um, instill trust in results that you get from your, your data mining in people. And the other side of it is, how do you know that the results that you're getting out are actually robust, reliable, trustworthy? Um, we hear a lot of people getting very nervous uh, uh, about these uh, increasing applications of data science too, maybe replacing human judgment uh, because they're afraid that there could be bias uh, in the way that you're analyzing the data, in the way that you're interpreting the data. And the field of data ethics is really taking off, which is, of course, incredibly interesting. You know, thinking uh, also about unintended consequences, maybe, of applying machine learning or deep learning algorithms to decision making. Uh, so, Laurie, do you see that awareness grow also in industry that, hey, we, we have to be really, really careful about what we're actually doing and whether or not it's ethical, whether we, we ensure equity in, say, health insurance decisions or financial decisions, mortgage lenders, uh, just yeah. a few examples. Yeah, I, you know, I, I do think there's a growing awareness of that, but there were actually two parts of what you said. The first part was around the risk associated with implementing some of these algorithms when it's hard to understand actually how they're working, and I think the vanguard there is around experimentation. And, you know, Caitlin and I have talked about this a lot, her journey of actually putting Netflix on a, on a process of um, very systematic experimentation where you actually test algorithms in a controlled environment and you actually get the proof before you roll it out. So I think that's one thing that, that people using analytics are investing heavily in alongside of the development of the algorithms. On the ethical considerations of you know, using more and more data for some of these very sensitive decisions, that's something which you know, has been tested, again, uh, drawing on my experience from FICO, the credit score is heavily regulated, uh, and the, the consumer credit industry is the use of data is heavily regulated. Uh, there are actually only, there are fewer than 10 variables that are used to predict the credit score, and none of them are age, gender, zip code, or anything could, that could infer uh, somebody's socioeconomic or race, gender, what have you. Uh, but the credit score has been around for a long time. It's been scrutinized by regulators, and now we have this vast explosion of you know, machine learning, you know, social media data to be used to profile people and what have you. And I think it goes far and far beyond what regulators can even cope with. So I think it is really incumbent on the people in this room, people working on these algorithms and companies like Google and Netflix and Facebook, uh, incumbent upon the industry and the practitioners to have a consciousness about this mm -hmm. uh, and to be self-policing. Uh, uh, because it's far and away beyond what regulators can uh, can get their heads around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to add anything, I, Gaitlin? No, I really agree, and I, I'm I'm always grateful that uh, that I'm in a company that cares about that kind of thing because it would be very tough for me to um, to live with the kind of things that we do without being extremely careful. Um, there are obvious things like you know data privacy and le legalities around that kind of stuff, which control some things. But as everyone knows, there's so much power in, in these automated um, methods, right, that you have to take extra precautions and pay a lot of attention to that. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah. You used the word automated. So that brings me to the next concern that you hear a lot, and it's automation mm -hmm. as a result of this. So it was at a conference uh, just two weeks ago where somebody said who was working in healthcare said, oh, doctors will be obsolete <laughs> at some point because we'll just use deep learning algorithms to figure out what's wrong with people, right? And one was being a little bit facetious and said, well, we just need to take a picture of the patient and then the algorithm will figure out what's wrong with you, <laughs> right? And with your heart rate and so on. Um, and all we need is, is people that can take care of the bedside. So in other words, we need nurses, but we don't need no doctors. 
But uh, all joking aside, you know, automation is on a lot of people's minds. And of course, that's already happening in manufacturing, but it could happen in many other professions. Uh, people think with the rise of artificial intelligence and, and, and data science. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think you will have a job five years from now? I she do. Will. I do. <laughs> I, think, I, think, uh, I do think some things will be automated, but the reality is a lot of this stuff, the autom even the automation, is really helping um, humans to still be smarter, and there's still this human element surrounding things. So I think so in some areas, jobs will just shift. Um, exactly. But the but this field is you know the power of it really is in the mixture of how it's used and there's a lot of human element around that um, and decision making. Okay. So I totally agree with that and that's why I talk about the role of the knowledge worker is really changing. So in all of these expert judgment decision processes, medical professionals, creatives, what have you, um, I think the bar will just go up uh, in terms of their competency and the way they use the combination of the tools that are available. Um, I think lower level, easier, more you know, simple, straightforward tasks will be automated, but I think it will actually place um, more burden on the knowledge workers to be smarter and to be savvy in how they use the tools. Well, we have one minute left before we need to switch over, and so I'm going to ask you to um, formulate one message that you want to send to everybody here, you know, women entering the field, women in the field, and as well, of course, as everybody uh, seeing the live stream around the world. Well, I sort of joked, right? I wrote my LinkedIn profile, and at the bottom of it, I said, it's never been a better time to be a data geek, but now I'm gonna change it to, it's never been a better time to be a woman in data science. Wow. Excellent. I would say a similar thing, like keep, keep at it. It's a wonderful field and focus on your strengths, um, which is a piece of advice I got at some point along my career. I've had a personal um, struggle, as I'll bet many women do, with confidence during the course of my career. And someone gave me great advice. You know, there's, we always want to work on the things that we can improve, but your strengths and, and thinking about how you can even apply those further can often be a more efficient way to um, have your impact. I think that's a great note to end on. Thanks so much for joining us today, Laurie, Caitlin. Yeah.